Welcome to History Respawned. I'm your host, Bob Whitaker. On today's show, we'll be considering two titles in the Assassin's Creed series, Freedom Cry and Liberation. Both games are set in the 18th century Caribbean. Our historical expert for today's show is Jessica Luther, a freelance writer and historian from Austin, Texas. Okay, welcome to History Respawned. I'm joined today by uh, our guest, Jessica Luther, a freelance writer and historian living in Austin, Texas. How's it going, Jessica? Good, how are you? I'm very good. Thank you for joining us. So, um, today we are going to be talking about Assassin's Creed Freedom's Cry, which is a DLC for Assassin's Creed 4. And then also we're talking about Assassin's Creed Liberation. Uh, which was originally a uh, PlayStation Vita game, which recently came out on the more uh, readily available consoles. Thank goodness, or else nobody else would play it. Um, so uh, both of these games have pretty explicit uh, portrayals of slavery, of black life in the Atlantic during the 18th century. Um, but I was hoping you might give us a sense about what slavery was like in the Caribbean uh, during the 18th century. And and how does that uh, slavery compare to the portrayal of slavery in North America during the same time period? Sure. I think one of the things that's the most important uh, is that slavery in the Caribbean was an incredibly brutal system in a way that even what we imagine as a brutal system. Um, slavery in the Caribbean was... I mean, we're talking about islands, which I think is mm -hmm. really important. That sort of geographical space, which I understand is very important in Assassin's Creed 4, sort of the movement. But islands matter, right? Like, they're mm -hmm. incredibly um, small. A lot of them are very small, even the larger islands. Um, and, and so what happened was that you would get these incredibly robust plantation systems in these very small spaces. And so they're making a ton of money in an area with like one single resource basically. And so they're like right. importing a bunch of stuff from other places. Um, and it, it's much harder in the Caribbean. To, there's not sort of a, um, they don't have generations of right. enslaved people is a big one. Right. So it's a sort of brutal system where they would literally work people to death. And then replace them with with new um, enslaved people versus sort of our idea when we think of slavery in North America. There's a lot about I mean, there was sort of a conscious creation, intentional creation of of, um, of slave life, right, of slave um I don't want to say breeding is like the worst word local for this. reproduction, but yeah, right. right? Yes. And, um, and so you get where there's a point in the U S South where they're actually like maintaining the population. They by slave by enslaved people actually reproducing. When we think of like a Haitian revolution happening, it makes sense. It would happen in an Island space, right? A very contained sort of space, but also in a space where they were really going up against some incredible brutality very brutal circumstances and what sort of crops what sort of uh, 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 plantation what were the plantations growing in the Caribbean uh, well the vehicle was certainly sugar right mm -hmm. um, and so my expertise is in the island of Barbados mm -hmm. and um, they received the knowledge of growing sugar sometime in the 17th century, mid 17th century. And they literally deforested the entire Island within mm. two decades just to replace it with sugar cane. Um, and then Jamaica, you know, people from Barbados ran out of land. They went to Jamaica. They basically populated Jamaica with sugar cane. Um, and I believe that was just as true in the French empire. Um, sugar was so sugar is like this amazing commodity. That's never law. Like it's never dipped in. Mm -hmm. It's like an incredibly stable, always growing um as far as economically it's incredible it's just very vi you know it's um it's always making a lot of money uh mm -hmm. to this day so mm -hmm. and then of course that's why the caribbean's famous for rum right they started to figure out sort of other ways to use parts of sugar cane in order to both make alcohol to drink but then also to sell um so a lot of what we think of um in the Caribbean is sugar. It's like a land of sugar cane. Right. And of course, uh, sugar cultivation is pretty exhausting work. Is that right? 
Yeah. Yes. And part of what, part of the brutality of that space is that harvesting and especially the actual crushing of the sugar out of mm -hmm. the cane, um, is, can be an incredibly violent experience. And so mm -hmm. the machinery that they would use, um, even if you just caught your finger in it, your whole body would go in it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you could read plenty of stories of sort of the violence around just the actual act of harvesting and then, um, getting the sugar out of the cane. Um, that alone was, was bad enough. Mm. So, um, both of these games are, uh, they are set in, within the French empire during the 18th century. Um, the Assassin's Creed Freedom's Cry takes place in what is now Haiti, mm -hmm. uh, at the time was Saint-Domingue. And then uh, Assassin's Creed Liberation occurs later on in the 18th century in New Orleans. So what was life like for slaves in the French Empire uh, compared to other colonial empires? I mean, Haiti is its own, it's its own thing within even the French Empire. Mm -hmm. um, so it has this very interesting sort of demographics going on where you would have um, rich, freed people of color and mm -hmm. then rich white planters and you would have the sort of racial mixing that um is clearly present in assassin's creed 3 it's sort of incredibly interesting intense overall sort of stratification of society mm -hmm. in that space um again because they were incredibly wealthy and empire is so amazing in that um these islands were so important to the french empire but also mm -hmm. so far away from France. Mm -hmm. And so um, what's going on in Haiti is sort of its own little thing um, that everyone knows about, but they don't want to really do anything about either. Part of what's different, the way that law works is, is different among those. Uh, I mean, I think we're most familiar, of course, because in America we come from the Brit mainly the British system, um, right. where we have um, common law, and which also goes up against sort of, you know, set statutes. Um, mm -hmm. But it has a sort of flexibility in it that um, that you don't have on the on the continent where they have mainly just statute law. And right. so you get it's almost like in the English system. They had this way of sort of manipulating things around common law that mm -hmm. made it easier for them locally to control populations. So mm -hmm. whereas in France you have and the Code Noir, which yes. was a late 17th century slave code created from the top down. The king sanctioned this. It applied in all of the French Empire. Um, the creator of both of these games, she's very, I think, Jill Murray, um, is very clear in interviews that like Code Noir was and instrumental to how they thought through what they were going to paint of the land of this French empire. Yes. Whereas in the English Caribbean or the British Caribbean, uh, which Barbados was sort of the place where they learned to do all this. Like they literally created local law in Barbados, mm. the first slave code ever in the English empire. And then they sent that out. And, but you get all these different kinds of versions of slave codes based on what's going on in the land in those particular spaces, both in North America and the Caribbean, the French have a sort of larger system under which they're working. There is a sort of continuity across the islands, across... Mm -hmm. I mean, you get amazing stories of people from Haiti going back to France with their mixed-race children and having this like kind of almost surreal experience where they're living under the same law, but it's being interpreted differently because in France they just don't have as many black people. So they right. don't sort of know how to, <clears throat> they don't know how to manage them culturally. And, and so you get that, whereas the interpretation of that exact same law in Haiti is so different and mm -hmm. so much allows so much more space for people to move around in, in these mixed race families and have rights and laws that they just don't have right. in France, even though it's the exact same code. Um, Versus something like in the Caribbean, in the British Caribbean, or in North America, depending on where you go, the law is going to change. Um, so if there's a bigger black population somewhere, they're going to have much stricter sort of laws around how they're managing those populations. It's just a very different sort of, I can't, I, you just can't 
in my head, I couldn't imagine someone from Barbados going to England with their mixed race family and assuming that that the law would be the same, that people would respond the same way, that that that, that kind of story couldn't have right wouldn't have happened as readily as it did right. in the relationship of France to its colonies. Does that make right. sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the Code Noir was created in the late 17th century under King Louis the Fourteenth, And I, you know, as scholars have a lot to say about sort of why and where this came from. And it was very much a document um, that just kind of listed out where people of color could go and what they could do and it kind of defined I think it sort of defined who counted right Right. as people of color which basically stood in as the other as the non-French basically Mm. so part of the code noir was very specific about where Jews could go and what they could do and they were very much othered in the exact same document that was basically created as a reaction to France kind of freaking out that people were coming back from the colonies with black people and mixed race children on boats Mm. with them. Mm. And like, how does a society suddenly make sense of, of that? Right. Right. Um, My understanding about it is that it was, it's totally a colonial creation or an imperial creation. Um, One of those sort of fear moments Mm -hmm. um, where like they needed control. Um, Mm -hmm. It is fascinating that it comes from the top down. I mean, as someone who studies British history, I just find that, like, absolutely amazing um, that the monarch would actually be the one sort of sanctioning this, like, imperial law about um, people of color. And and so part of it was that there was a lot of, a lot of, like, who could go where, who counted, who didn't, who's a subject, who's not. Um, In France, there was... uh, The Code Noir, I don't know if it was immediately or, you know, subsequently that you started, you had to register um, Mm -hmm. people. And so that was actually, there's great, you know, they're not great stories, but they're interesting historic history stories about families that were very confused. Like, do I have to register my daughter? Isn't she a subject, even though she's black? Like, um, people just not understanding sort of how how the law actually worked on the ground when they've been in this world where everything is much more fluid, right? So right. in a place like Haiti or Martinique or even New Orleans, that's part of what's going on in Assassin's Creed 3 with her, um, with Abilene's amazing ability to switch between she can be a, an assassin, she can be in dress of an enslaved person, and she can be in the dress of like a nice... Um, they call it a lady in a the game. A lady, yes, where yes. she's in this very beautiful green and cream dress. <laughs> um, and so sort of the brilliance of the fact that Aveline can do that, where she can literally switch her dress and her hair and how she physically moves and and be in all different parts of the society is so amazing. Uh, and, and while doing it while her skin color Right, while she is a person of color, right? Yes. And and so that sort of fluidity of her character is very reminiscent of the sort of fluidity moving through these spaces versus a place like France that freaks out. Yes. Like, you know, so their reaction is to create these sort of rigid laws around, like, who counts, who doesn't, and, and then say, this is true for the empire. And, I mean, that's... It's not to say that that isn't what happens in the British Caribbean with their local laws. Like, they, of Mm -hmm. course, are saying, these are the people who are enslaved, these are the people who are not, these are other, these are the other people, um, not us. I mean, like, in Barbados, which is a very small island, um, they had all these laws about escaped slaves. Well, there's a fear they'll get on boats, right, which I find very interesting as far as Assassin's Creed 4 and sort of boat being the reason you can like get around and that's your mobility right um but also you just go to other plantations and hang out until they got caught right Hmm. um and and so on the ground these spaces are so weird like who who really is like how do you tell who fits into the society 
and who doesn't when like literally running away is just running two miles down the road and then hiding out and where she actually fits in the society and I I just think that is I, I loved that that was an aspect because I think yeah. that's really important for understanding the colonies where slavery is actually happening versus sort of what it must have looked like from a place like France or England right. where things probably were much more rigid actually. Yeah. Well, I mean, you definitely get the, you know, what you were talking about with space and place definitely get a huge variation between freedom cry and liberation. So whereas in freedom cry, uh, Adewale, uh, the protagonist is in Haiti, uh, St. Domingue, and he has to worry about uh, being seen as a slave, uh, right. walking around on the street. There's slave catchers constantly moving through the city that you have to avoid in order to uh, avoid being caught and, you know, having to fight for your life. Uh, whereas in Liberation, you've, like you've described, you've got Aveline who is uh, able to switch these personas. And it's based off the fact that she is... Uh, in New Orleans, you know, near the end of the 18th century, not in the 1730s. And she is able to, you know, switch into different guises uh, based off of where she is. So she couldn't go into a plantation if she's dressed like a lady, for instance. Right. And so there are certain missions where she has to dress like a slave uh, in order to either go onto a plantation or to interact with other slaves to gain information. Uh, and then as the assassin, she has to worry about... Uh, her high profile, right? So with all these Assassin's Creed games, you're basically running around murdering people right. all the time. Uh, <laughs> whereas if you're the lady, you can move within uh, high society. Uh, you can move uh, out in public uh, without much fear of being attacked or being accosted. Uh, and so it allows you to gain information. It allows you to perform assassinations uh, in public without gaining the same notoriety yeah as the assassin or as the slave mm -hmm. uh, and then conversely as the slave you don't want to be in the slave persona uh out in the streets of new orleans because you can be accosted by guards you can be uh attacked by local merchants mm -hmm. uh and if you do anything that's seen as out of line uh in assassin's creed they give you quite a bit of leeway but if you do anything like say jump on a building <laughs> or uh run throughout the streets uh, they assume that you're up to no good and there's a good chance that mm. you'll be attacked if you're in the slave persona. So you it, it That's definitely, really interesting. Yeah, definitely get a good sense of place, uh, not only within the games, but also between the two games. Whereas Adewale has to be much more careful. Aveline hmm. can can more easily don different guises to uh reflect her situation, whatever can you know, whatever context she's in. Yeah. That's so fascinating. I'm really fascinated about the sort of relationship of um slavery to space uh, mm -hmm. because we do have these um, huge differences in sort of what's going on in North America versus what's going on in the Caribbean. And I, I'm fascinated that um, Adewale is helping the Maroon community. Yes. In Haiti, Maroons are often um, ex-slaves, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily freed slaves. A lot of them are runaway slaves who have created a community together somewhere in a way that's and they are threatening enough that um, slave owners just leave them alone, right? And right. sort of just say they're not worth it to deal with, so we're just going to let them sort of live in their part of the island. This is for, in, in British history, it's most famous in Jamaica, where there's a gigantic maroon community that ends up having sort of its own little nation state kind of thing going on um, at the same time in this incredibly... Um, brutal slave system that's happening next door is literally a maroon colony seeing the video of Adewale and how he has to like literally move from bush to bush mm -hmm. <laughs> like he'll literally crawl almost from one space to another in order to stay hidden mm -hmm. um, versus very much Aveline just running through the city but I love that I love the idea that the game with her if she's a slave on the street it makes her vulnerability so much greater mm -hmm. as, as a character. And I did find there was one, one part of the video where she was, yeah, she was dressed as a slave. So she's mm -hmm. on a plantation and she's trying to scout. She needs to go to the top of the, the big house and the plantation yes. to scout the entire scene. And she walks by 
this guy on the plantation and just like I'm just watching a video of a video game and I felt tense. <laughs> I felt tense yes. cuz you can tell like however they've created her her movement she tenses and sort of and I don't know if that's like you the way you play the game versus like the way that like you the way that she moved around that that man and he looks at her. Yeah. And I just was like, "Oh, don't don't hurt her." Um, <laughs> it was like my, my feeling as I was watching it. Yeah. Um, that's an amazing thing to sort of see how proscribed even their movements in, in the street were, right? Mm-hmm. The sort of like ongoing fear. Um, and it's really, really clear with Adewale, right? Yeah. Like in Haiti, he is literally trying to move without anyone seeing him because like just being seen as dangerous right. um, for a black person in Haiti. So that's amazing that that's in a video game, I have to yeah. say. I think yeah. that that is fast. That is just, that's the kind of thing that when you teach students about the history of slavery, that's the kind of thing that's really hard. It's an intangible that's hard to portray to them just through language. You, we read, you know, you have them read slave narratives and watch sort of recreations of, of that. And well, there's something about the experience of, of the video game allowing you to see, I mean, the, I just love these. I love the recreate. I loved just seeing what they thought 18th century New Orleans would have looked like, or like what mm-hmm. 18th century Haiti looked like. Um, but yeah, how low everything is. I think this, you know, they're like, everything in New Orleans is very low. There's yeah. only, you know, one to two stories on everything. Um, and then everything's tight. Like, she's running through a lot of tight spaces. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of people on the streets. There's a lot of animals on the yes. street as well, which I don't think a lot of students would realize that, you know, how common it was just to have animal grazing, you know, yeah. animals just free flowing throughout the street, wild dogs, pigs, Goats, right. all sorts of different animals, uh, just in constant contact. Yeah, in uh, Assassin's Creed Liberation with uh, Aveline's story, you know, within the game, the city of New Orleans passes from French hands to Spanish hands, and then back into French hands all throughout the course of the game. And it's not really clearly described as to why that's happening. There's some yeah. notion of wars uh, in Europe that's playing a role, <laughs> but. It doesn't seem to really play much of a uh, uh, or play much of an influence uh, on the characters' lives because they're all yeah. already living with each <laughs> other already. So it's like who's in control doesn't really matter uh, in that context. That's so great, right? Because this is one of the interesting things when you study people who live on the outskirts of an empire is that they always have sort of inferiority complexes mm-hmm. <laughs> with their relationship to the. Um, to the homeland, right? And that's sort of, that would be why, right? All of a sudden, like, France has just given Spain New Orleans in a treaty, and then Spain gives it back to France, who literally, like, within weeks or something, hands it over to the U.S., right? Yeah. Like, and within a span of, like, 20, 30 years, something, to 40 years, something like that. And so I had a friend who actually studied the law in New Orleans, um, and I feel like he studied early 19th century. So once the U S had taken over and it's brilliant, like exactly how you say. So for people who live there on the ground, it's just their life. Right. And yeah. they just keep doing it. And so, but one of the great things that they do is they figure out how to manipulate the law. So they'll show up in court and they'll be like, well, under Spanish law, I got to do it this way and you mm-hmm. haven't changed the law yet. So like, I still get to do it this way. And then the English, judges try like scrambling to figure out like is that true like is that real and so you get this sort of like weird even fluidity within the law yeah which, uh, we often imagine it as being this sort of very rigid thing in yeah. new orleans it's like this total mess and they and they have exploit that to no end um but yeah so the the caribbean is and new orleans which um you know post haitian revolution becomes like a huge influx of of Haitians to to that space too. New Orleans is, is totally fascinating. So uh, before we wrap up, I was hoping maybe you could uh, review for me a little bit the uh, mechanics of the slave trade. Sure. Uh, you know the Middle Passage, uh, how slaves were collected, how they were brought over, where they were distributed to. Yeah. Uh, if you could just describe that a little bit, 
uh, sure. for the audience. A very early 16th century, the Portuguese sort of were the first ones, right, that went into Africa. And, and slavery was not unknown before Europeans started to enslave Africans. Um, so it wasn't, it's not a great leap that they, you know, they tried to colonize Africa and then they just kept dying. So they decided not to do that. And then Africa is its own giant space, right? With a lot of different peoples in it. And at the time, and as of now, as in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, there were a lot of warring people. And so you, there was already, anytime there was war in the early modern period, Prisoners of war almost always became enslaved in some way, in some place, mm -hmm. right? Um, whether that be in the Ottoman Empire or, you know, Europeans with their own, you know, with Ottomans. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then, um, and so that sort of translates in Africa, where they go in and they, and the Europeans set up forts and they interact with local um, African leaders and those... And so they start to buy slaves in the way that you just would. Like, that was not a strange thing to happen. The difference is that it becomes this huge economic system in a way that it that slavery hadn't before, right? So mm -hmm. the Europeans figure out pretty quickly that they could bring these... One of, the, one of the ways that slavery works is that it's most effective if you separate people geographically from the place that they are from, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you take them from Africa across an entire ocean and to the Caribbean, to Brazil, to North America, and it makes it physically impossible for them to get home, right? Yes. Um, and that both kills their spirit, but also just makes it physically difficult for them to mm -hmm. escape um, their conditions. So you get it where... And, you know, at first in small numbers, they're bringing people over, you know, Columbus had slaves on, on his boat. Um, and then he, and, and the way that you do, you put native people from the Caribbean and you take them back to Spain because you want to separate them from where they are from. Right. And so it starts pretty simple in that way. And then once Europeans figure out that, oh, hey, we can bring these people over here, exploit their labor to, as Phys like literally to, until they die that works out really well for them and so they just keep doing it and this, so the numbers like and you can see this in Barbados where at first they're using indentured servants who are who are English mm -hmm. that's what they're used to that's the kind of exploited labor system that the English are used to right. and then it turns out that like people don't want to go to like they don't like living in Barbados it's, mm -hmm. it's gross the English don't know how to do it they die all the time um and so, it, you know, the Spanish have slaves. That looks like a good system. The Dutch show up. They have sugar. They're like, it's easier if you use these enslaved people to do it. And so within like a decade, they basically switch their entire system over into mm. slavery. And so Barbados, for the, for the British, it's the most eastern Caribbean island. So they would, you would have merchants, slavers, go to certain parts of Africa on the, on the west side. And they would fill up their boats. And they would then bring them across the Atlantic, which was, you know, a weeks-long journey. The horrific stories. Some of the most sure. horrific stories you'll read are Middle Passage stories. I read one once. It was early 18th century. They were going to go... It was some English guy writing a diary back to his sister. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of his sort of casualness of how he describes the experience. So um, there are certain parts of Africa uh, where you would actually drive your slave ship like your ship down a river you mm -hmm. know so you go kind of far inland to where you actually pick up the in pick up enslaved people and then you have to get out of the river in order to get to the ocean and so he's describing like them chaining the slaves right mm -hmm. their feet because like this is a big moment where if you can get off the boat you can get home you can at least right. get back to land before right. you hit the ocean and so he said but we forgot to chain up the women we, you know, sort of there was an assumption, you know, men, not women. And, and he describes four women getting off the boat. And he says, we couldn't catch all three of them, but we got the fourth one um, because she was pregnant. Mm. And so bring, they bring her on this boat. And I, it, that has stuck with me because I sort of think like she then gave birth mm. while enslaved, maybe on a ship if she mm. made it. Um, 
But in the same way that, like, the islands are really dangerous, disease-ridden places, that's even more true when you get a bunch of people stacked on top of one another in a boat for weeks across the Atlantic. So the Middle Passage, you hear a lot about disease, them throwing people overboard. I mean, they're not even dead yet, but they're they're diseased. Um, And so in the way that it worked for the British is most of the time they would come to Barbados first. That was the big hub. Um, There was a lot of slave trading that happened in that space. Um, So then they would get on the boat from there and go to Jamaica, go to South Carolina, go to New Orleans, go to um, Cartagena or go to Haiti or whatever other sort of ports that they were working with other empires. Um, And so you did have sort of like a system inside the Caribbean where people are selling enslaved people. Um, but you did have these kind of first ports where people would go, um, you know, the Barbadians wanted the best slaves. There was a lot of, of that happening too. And so you get slave pens that they would hold people in. Mm -hmm. Um, you would get the actual, you know, slave block where they would sell them. And there's Um, definitely some depiction of that in, uh, Freedom Cry, actually, where you go into, uh, Haiti, uh, Saint-Domingue. And you've got uh, slave pens, you've got slave block where they actively sell the slaves. And Adewale is actually left with a choice in that and he wants to support the Maroon community by expanding the community. So he can either free the slaves using violence or he can actually purchase the slaves Mm -hmm. from the slave block. So you're left as the player with that decision, whether you want to risk your own life to free the slaves using violence, or do you want to literally buy into the system uh, right. with whatever money you have? Right. So. That's interesting. I can talk about this too long. But, you know, <laughs> I think one of the things that's interesting for me about these games is sort of the idea of um, revolt is so uncommon, mm-hmm. right? Just generally. Re- rebellion in slave society, in slave societies in the Caribbean and North America it's an incredibly uncommon thing. So I, there's something about that aspect of this, like that these kind of characters wouldn't have been real, you know, right. like as sure. far as actual experience of, of enslaved. Um, Cause it's so terrifying, right? Like, right. cause even like what you were describing with the maroon communities, they basically lived as a separate society, but not really engaging with, yeah. The established society on the island and not really attempting to violently overthrow it until much later in the 18th century. Right. right. And I mean, other than the Haitian Revolution, there was never a totally successful slave revolt. So, mm-hmm. you know, you think, I think a lot of when we, as free people living totally outside of a, of a slave system, think like, well, I would rebel Well, yeah, but you also want to live, right? Mm -hmm. And so enslaved people knew that revolting wasn't going to get them much of anything, right? And sometimes it's totally worth dying, right? And that's Mm -hmm. clear from individual slave stories and slave stories of group rebellion, um, that there are definitely times where these people were choosing um, death over the hellscape that was their life, but it was also their life. And so um, sort of that moment where he's choosing whether or not to physically buy into the system or or to fight back um, isn't really a is is so much mo- more morally complex than right than, not a clear cut choice yeah because right. um, he buys in and then he can save other people later right rather than right. dying I mean it's just it's so it's all so complicated in the story of I, I find rebellion to be totally fascinating because it's a moment where we can really see what people were willing to do with their bodies to like mm. the nth degree of sort of that, that end of, of, of slavery. But at the same time, I totally respect the fact that like almost none of them rebelled. Yeah. Like they were just trying to, they were just trying to survive. Yeah. Um, and that's there's, also complicated. Yeah. There's an interesting moment near the end of the game. I don't want to try to give away any spoilers, but you were mentioning the uh, local madam in uh, Alawale's game and there's a moment at the end of the game where uh, 
Atawali's come back from attempting to free a, a group of slaves on a slave ship that's gone terribly wrong, and most of the slaves have died mm-hmm. in a shipwreck. And uh, the madam character, she comes up to him and asks, you know, is it really worth this violence? Even if we were to be freed, is it worth our lives? Right? And mm-hmm. I think it points to that kind of that kind of problem where, you know, you could be fighting for freedom, you could be fighting for uh, release from bondage, but at the same time, there's terrible human cost and human lives. And right. She's and, making the point, you only live once, so... Right, and I think she's also really pointing to, like, what does freedom mean, mm-hmm. even? Like, what does it mean to be a... Like, um, Aveline is... She's, she's free, right? She's a free she person is, of yes. color? She is, yes. She's a free person of color. At the same time, moving through a world where she has to be extremely careful with where she's putting herself all the time. Um, so what does freedom mean for her, mm-hmm. even in that context, right? Um mm-hmm. What does it mean to actually be free? Um, that sort of fear, that sort of, you're not free from violence. You're not free from, you know, redi- like senseless violence that no one, well, there won't be a response to even, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and so I think that's, that's so, and I just love the idea of sort of complicating even um, within a framework of, you know, assassins are fighting for freedom. But then now you have these two characters who are assassins, but like freedom is a totally different concept for them. Because mm-hmm. um, what does it even mean once you technically have legal freedom? It, mm-hmm. It's not the same thing that you or I now would imagine freedom sure. to be. Um, and I find that that's great. That is exactly the sort of thing that you want when you are trying to teach people about. The, the history of slavery or why that matters because it's true even today that there are all kinds of you know we're all we could all be legally free but our actual freedom as individuals or as part of certain groups is totally prescribed by all kinds of cultural things um and that's more readily or it's easier to see that in a space that has slavery especially racialized slavery, right? And so someone like Aveline, who's mixed race, who's free, but not really. Um, mm-hmm. That's great. That's an amazing thing that can be taught. At the same time, that's someone's just playing a, a game right. in a really cool setting that looks really neat, and they get to beat people up. Um, yeah, right? Like, But that that's also what's happening. That's just, I, as someone who struggles to teach people what it, what that was like, you know, as much as I can even know, but you know, from what I've researched, this is like a, a totally amazing way. I would love to teach U.S. history again, and I would totally bring this as part of how I would teach it into the classroom. Maybe, maybe a little bit complicated because of the use of violence, but uh, I think in terms of history, you can take maybe a half as glass, a half glass full approach. Well, I also think. Um, well, this is the other thing I was. I actually, because you prepped me for the videos, and you said there's a lot of violence in these, and um, so I was like, okay. I, like, sort of, like, emotionally prepared to watch it. Then I was like, yeah, this isn't so bad. Like, I actually found it to be way less violent than you warned. Like, I don't know. For me, the Caribbean in my head was so, so violent. Like, everything about it was violent. There was just people died all the time. Um, There's a great book. Vincent Brown wrote a book, The Reaper's Garden, I think, maybe. Um, okay. about Jamaica in the 18th century, but it's all about death. Like, death is the mm-hmm. lens through which he tells you the history of the Caribbean, and specifically Jamaica, because there's so much of it. So, part of me thinks, and then slavery itself, in, in any context, is always violent and bloody. So, on some level, I was um, like, no, this isn't bad. <laughs> this is This doesn't seem that terrible to me. So, um, because that's remarkable to me as somebody who plays video games, has played video games for decades, and is always, you know, I think one of the reasons why this story, like you said, doesn't get as, or these two stories don't get as much publicity is because of the fact that it's in a video game seen as kind of the purview of, uh, you know, demented, young, uh, white, and Japanese men. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, and not really acceptable for 
the rest of society. Right. Uh, but I think, like you said, what's remarkable about this game is that it kind of overthrows a lot of those assumptions and it forces the players to engage with maybe their own assumptions about uh, race, about gender. gender. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, it's still couched very much in this kind of violent setting. Yeah. Uh, which I think is... But it's actually true. It, it hurts the game. It's actually true, and you're, you're <laughs> saying perhaps that maybe... Maybe it could have been more violent. It, oh, it could have been. It, it could have been, been more accurate. violent, for sure. <laughs> for sure. I mean, I, yeah. So, I'm really <laughs> thankful that you have asked me to talk about this, and that I finally got to really look at the games, and and I didn't even know about Freedom Cry. So, I'm really happy that um, now I know so much more, and I'm definitely, I really want to play these games. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, I think that does it for us here at uh, History Respawn. Thanks to our guest, Jessica Luther, for coming on. And uh, please tune in for more episodes.